Thank you so much, Peter. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. I'm very excited. Um, first and foremost, uh, my name is Jonathan Allsbury, um, also known as Jojo. Everyone definitely calls me Jojo. I welcome you all to do so. Um, pronouns are he, him. And I'm in my living room with the white walls, mirrored archways behind me. That's not another room, that's a mirror um, back there. And I've got photos above the mirrors and I'm wearing a dark black shirt, brown skin with the sun shining in front of my window. Um, and I've got salt and pepper beard going on here. First of all, I'd love to absolutely welcome you all to turn back your back on your cameras <laughs> if you would like that. Um, please, please do so. I don't like staring at myself. Um, so <laughs> I definitely want this to feel like a discussion. Um, I'm not going to lecture at you. I want to hear questions that you have. I want to hear your experiences over the past year and any moments that you feel like you can insert um, into the conversation and the discussion are welcome. Um, I definitely plan on giving a little bit of an insight about how I've spent the last year. Um, I'll talk a little bit about who I am as well. Um, I just want to give a little moment for people to show up and to people for people to feel a little more comfortable to turn on their cameras if you would like. Um, this is uh, definitely a community space that I like to create here in this virtual space. Um, so first thing I want to do is start with some um, business here a little bit. I like to do a lot of people are implementing different practices in this virtual realm that we've entered. Um, and one of those things is land acknowledgements. Um, something that I've really liked to do on Zoom is not necessarily a land acknowledgement, but a digital acknowledgement. Um, so I'm just going to share that with everyone right now. Um, I recognize that we are using the technology of Zoom to have this conversation. Zoom is headquartered in what is now called San Jose, California, where, uh, which are the traditional lands of the Ohlone and Tamien peoples. We acknowledge that this that the internet is not theoretical. There are specific places where fiber pipelines touch down on land and places where servers with wires and metal boxes exist, powered by generators. So in a way, we're all gathered, gathering on lands across the world because while none of us might be um, in so-called China, where there are servers that are carrying data from our conversation through that landscape, these pipelines and boxes that are carrying our thoughts and ideas, work and images, art and conversations, these are all made of elements that are of the earth. <clears throat> the mining and the digging and the grabbing of deep sea sand that creates, for example, the glass on your screens, poisons the water, which poisons the earth. And also for many people within differing abilities, um, the, this technology creates more opportunity to communicate as seen during the current pandemic. How do we engage with this technology when, there are, when there's blood on this machine and therefore on our hands? Let us use it for the good. Let us use it sparingly. Let us hold on to our machines for years and years and years. And let us put forth our very best with it and respect the blood that has been shed here. So it's gonna take a moment for us to take a couple breaths together. Let's take three deep breaths together. Let's just kind of relax our minds. You can soften your eyes and I'll breathe with you. Let's come in. And again in. And exhale. And one last breath in. And exhale. Thank you for sharing that with me. Um, anytime that I do these Zoom meetings that we have, I gotta move. I'm a dancer. So before I go into who I am and all of that anymore, Let's all, I'm gonna say one more time. If you're on here, I'm gonna invite you to turn your cameras on. You're gonna be jealous if you don't. Um, and so everybody just shake it out just a little bit. Just back away from your screen a little bit here. Yes, that's wonderful. So however you want, just gather the air in your space 
in between your palms and create kind of a pocket in your palm, between your palms of energy and space, right here between your hands. Yes, now let's have a little pulse. Yes, gather it in. Just have a little heartbeat to your hands, kind of like a jellyfish. Yes, join me in this movement, wonderful. Yes, and now let that float upward toward the sky. Nice. And then removing one of your hands and seeing that hand up there, just let it float down like if it were a feather. Nice and easy, beautiful. Yes. And plant that down below the screen, under the earth, as we'll say. And then I just want you to get a little rhythm in your shoulders. Get a little bit of beat. Just get a little rhythm in your shoulders. Let it drop to the beat. Drop that rhythm to the beat. Drop that rhythm to the beat. Add a little sway to your rhythm and the beat. Sway with me to the beat. Don't worry, sway, how? Mm. Get a little bit of sway to the beat. Uh-huh, yes, here. Now breathe the shoulders up and roll them down the back. And that's it, see? You gotta move a little bit, just a little bit of movement just to get us in. Thank you so much for moving with me and sharing in that. So let's get into it. My name is Jonathan, yes, and Jojo is what I am called. I am a dancer, um, a former musician, but I still consider myself a musician because I work with a lot of rhythm. I did play percussion when I was very young for quite a while, actually. Um, didn't really get into piano too much, but I definitely started with the bells and then did the drum line thing and orchestra and all of that in the snare and bass drum. I love bass drum, the baby bass in marching band is what I was. Um, but dance has always been a huge, huge part of my life. Uh, my mother's a dancer, so I grew up in normal Illinois, uh, dancing with my mother um, at Agape Dance Center, which is a liturgical dance company. So I grew up dancing for the Lord um, in a religious dance company, liturgical. And um, so I never bowed. It was never about, I was never receiving applause. It was never about, look at me. It was always in reverence to this gift that I've been given. So this is where I, I really come from when I'm, even to this day, with dance. Um, from normal, and I left and moved up here to Chicago, which is where I am right now in Chicago, Illinois. I went to Chicago Academy for the Arts and then for high school and then graduated from there and went to the Juilliard School, which is where I really got to dive into music. Um, lots and lots of uh, collaboration going on there with live music and digital music and um, lots and lots of co composer um, collaboration going on there. Um, not enough. I wanted more, of course, since <laughs> I'm here. And from there, I met a choreographer, Lar Lubavitch and Azure Barton, um, and began working professionally with both of them. Um, I skipped over a little moment there. While I was at Juilliard from my sophomore year on, I would guest at the Metropolitan Opera, which became an addiction to doing opera because it was all the things looped in together. You have the musicians right there, the conductors telling you essentially what to do, everything but the steps. Um, and you have the singers right there with you, fashion, set design. It's just the most amazing thing. Um, it's been about a few years since I've stepped on an opera stage, but I am returning to LA Opera this year for Tannhauser with Azure Barton. So very excited for that. If you're in LA, come check us out in September, or when is that, October. Um, and, so yes, and then from there, I, I'm still working with Azure and Lar as a, as a dancer and a stager and a rehearsal director. Um, and, but I'm currently working for Hubbard Street Dance Chicago back home, very happy to be back home and rehearsal director here at Hubbard Street under the direction uh, first of Glenn Edgerton, but now of Linda Denise Fisher Harrell, uh, incredible, incredible woman. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my journey to here. Um, this talk today is really about process. Um, I have been obsessed with process from the beginning of my career. I've, I've never really been interested in the product, in putting on a big show. Even when I had a, a um, online dance company that I started way back in 2000 and 
before, um, before people were making dance videos. Um, it was not about the product. It was really just about getting people together and seeing what we could create in the moment. Um, and not really about refining. I never really, if anyone's been into video editing, you don't really finish your video. You just kind of put it out when it's done. If you never put it out, you probably keep working on it for forever. <laughs> and I still work on some of those videos that are old. That's a KDT, Contemporary Dance Theater, if you wanna YouTube it. There's lots and lots of old, old videos that are heavily edited <laughs> um, with filters and things. I was shooting everything on my laptop with as, as the camera and then using only iMovie to do all the editing. So you'll, you'll see um, if you take a look at that. Um, but yes, I really want to talk a little bit about uh, today about process and joyful process. Um, I come from a place of joy very much so whenever I'm in the studio, you know, with dancers, depending on the, the composer, uh, different from musicians, I would say, um, when you're in a creative process, you have to, the dancers are your notes essentially. And you they're there for, from the beginning until the end of that process. Now, maybe you are very fortunate and you can compose with the orchestra there. <laughs> um, I haven't really witnessed that. I think that would be awesome. Um, but in dance, the dancers are there the entire process and it can be difficult um, to be at the front of the room and to be managing how to create, how to, uh, when you get a roadblock, when you're mentally blocked, how do you push through that while you have 30 plus people staring at you like, so what are we doing now? You know, that's that's very difficult and it can become very tense, especially when someone's not playing the note or doing the step the way you want to do that. So where I come in is as a rehearsal director or a creative assistant is I manage the vibe in the room. Um, and it became very clear to me when I was um, early on in my career, about, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago, that this this is a thing that this positivity that I put out that is so natural for me, isn't a, a natural, isn't a wide commodity. Not everybody is like always happy and presenting joy in the space. And so then it became a task for me to really bring that into the space because it produced, it elevated the productivity um, and it's fun. And I, and I found great joy in that myself. So over these, this through the pandemic, fast forward, um, talk about a challenge. How do you keep, so Hubbard Street, let's talk about Hubbard Street specifically. This is a company of 16 dancers um, and uh, 14 at the moment, actually 14 dancers. And generally we are working 52 weeks out of the year um, in the space together. It really is a family working on new pieces, uh, putting up older rep, going out on tour constantly. When the pandemic hit, we were actually on tour in Milan when Milan shut down and then came back to JFK with no restrictions, of course. Luckily, everyone was healthy and that was all fine. Um, but then we were here in Chicago on the Harris stage the day that the shutdown happened, about to open for our show, devastating. Um, we had about three dancers who had yet per to perform with the company. so. How do I, how do we move forward positively um, and keep productivity going on? You know, as dancers, we have to keep working. We have to keep that creative stamina going. How do we um, keep this productivity going? We can't take a year off from creating because the body fatigues, one, the mind creatively fatigues. And as you all know, as artists, you know, you we're able to keep creating, of course but if you can't move through space, it's not the same. So I immediately went to Zoom, here we are, um, to figure out how we can come together. This was, this is the most important thing I feel, is coming together and finding how we can connect with people outside of our community, um, not just our land community, but our artistic community as well. So what did I do? Um, with Hubbard Street, we started talking to elders. We reached out to choreographers like Matsek, Ana Laguna, Frank Chavez, and Alonzo King and had discussions with the dancers just to really feed that 
talk just to talk about how they were manifesting this and how they were navigating uh, this new pandemic that had happened. Um, as, as well as taking company class every day we were in class. We shut down on a Friday, Monday we were in class on Zoom, figuring out. And I became kind of the Zoom guru of the organization, even though I didn't know anything about Zoom, but you know, that's what happened. <laughs> we figured it out, that's what we do. Um, so at this point, it was like, it was clear, this is helping. We're meeting every day, we're getting a regimen, we're talking, we're talking about dance, maybe even creating a little bit here and there, really stumbling along the way as I'm sure you've all witnessed. Um, then it became clear, it was like, okay, not only do we need to keep our bodies active, but it's our brain. Like we need, what's gonna happen whenever we come out of this and we have a choreographer who comes in and they wanna create a very dense piece of work, we're gonna burn out. It's, it's, it's I don't have the stamina to like spend six hours at a time in a studio figuring out, is it this or is it this or is it this? You know, it's, we have to keep that muscle working. We have to keep that curiosity, that curiosity, that, um, that percolation of curiosity, that's what I wanna say, active. Um, so what happened at this point was, let's actually figure out what it is to actually have a process. Uh, over Zoom, when we're in these squares, you know, with dancers, we're constantly looking in the mirror, and then we're able to see what the step is in this way, but then you're dealing with this technology. What became clear for me was it's less about, I won't say less about, was the importance of energy. And when you infuse a process with positivity, and well, whatever you fuse, infuse the process with, that's what's going to be at the very end there. That I think of the best, um, the best analogy that I can give in this moment would be like when you listen to the music of, let's pick an era, the 60s, you know, you can hear what they were feeling at that time, the unrest the liberation, the freedom, you hear that in there. And it's the same thing I feel with dance, no matter what the piece is about, whatever their process that they went through is, it could be esplanade, which is running and jumping and sliding and joy. If that process of learning that work was arduous and not fun and full of terror, <laughs> then you're not gonna get that when you're watching that on the stage. And it is different every time. It is, it's, it is a ephemeral, art form, you know, once it's done, it's done. And even the next night, it's not gonna be the same, even if it is the same cast. So for everyone, just to think about it, and maybe you can put this in the chat, um, if you, excuse me, if you would like, I would love to hear about a process, how you, a process that you experienced that, where it was literally, the, the piece was incredible. You loved this piece, but the process wasn't great. Or the process was great, but then it was like, well, I didn't really enjoy this piece. I just would love to hear music or dance. I'm sure we have other uh, artists in here of different uh, genres, but I would love to, if you would like to, we'll create a little cue if you want to, if, if it doesn't fit in the chat, but um, I'd love to respond and hear some of that. So that's for y'all. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the collaborations that we did do in this season that were really interesting because there's so many. So I would invite you all to check out Hubbard Street, their website. There is the hub on the website that has um, quite, a, quite a bit of a lot, all the works that we created actually. Um, and I'm just going to share, can I do this? I think I can. Yes, I can share my screen. So the first work that we created was called A Tale of Two. Um, and this was really about, um, Rita Butler choreographed this film and directed this film. Um, and it's really a, a social justice work. It was about her experience here in Chicago. Um, she had all original music with a composer named Daryl Hoffman, who is also Chicago based and uh, a great friend. Um, really, really incredible to work with. 
She also got music from Chance the Rapper for free. We didn't have to deal with um, any, if we didn't have to pay for that, which was really, really great because it's a family friend. Um, but I encourage you to check out all of these films. I won't even go down that pathway, but this was incredible because the collaboration that happened um, with Daryl was in real time. So she, he gave Rena a few tracks and we were able to dance to that and she created, she kind of augmented a few sections from a work that she had done live because this was really the beginning of the pandemic and we really didn't know how this was going to pan out, uh, pun intended. And then In Any Event was next, which was choreographed, I'm sorry, uh, The Sky Was Different was next, which was choreographed by Jonathan Fredrickson with a Russian composer who was actually also a dancer named Oleg Stepanov. Um, this spoke directly to creative stamina because there was no connection between um, the, the composer and the dancers. But what Jonathan did was he gave a whole long list of words. Just, he asked the first question was, how are you? And it's a loaded question, loaded baked potato question. Um, so that was really interesting because both Jonathan and Oleg, who they both uh, work for Fina Bausch now, uh, Wuppertal and Wuppertal, so there was this wild time difference of, you know, Jonathan was up until six o'clock in the, in the morning sometimes uh, working with the dancers. And it's just, it was pretty wild uh, how it all came together, but it's a stunning piece of work um, that, I, that I really, really enjoyed being a part of the process with because in the end, you know, you have to pull all of those things together. And um, when you're not rehearsing with music with the dancers, it's, it's tricky. Um, once we get through these, I'll go back in a moment to the chat. Um, and then after that was in, in, any, in any Event, which was actually the Schubert music, the trio in E flat, um, which was augmented by Michael Wall. So this is very interesting because she, Michael Wall in, interspersed text with the music. Um, so it was a game of composing and um, stringing together already existing music and text and making this really beautiful score along with one of the dancers plays an accordion uh, in there. So that was really dealing with communication and boundaries. This was happening about when we weren't sure, you know, there was perhaps vaccinations, perhaps we could come together. Um, I should say before that everything was made separate. We were none of the dancers were in space until the filming when we were able to um, test and do all of these things and make sure that people weren't going to infect each other. Um, and then after this was Half of Us, which is a film that was done in collaboration with the two musicians you see in the back. It's a band called Ohm, uh, Seema Cunningham and Macy Stewart. Incredible, incredible, more of a music video style along with Ended When, which was um, a work sung by Alencia Norris, uh, danced by one of our dancers. And then finally, Greener Grass, which is um, a work that was inspired by the, um, the weaker crisis going on. And uh, this music was done by Jerome Begin. Now, I'm gonna dive into that one a bit. Jerome is a good friend. He was one of the professors at Juilliard and still is actually, um, teaches composition. Uh, for the dancers. He's the mu mus musical portion of that. And he spoke about this collaboration being um, not the, his favorite way of doing this because he likes to work in tandem with the choreographer. Like you're building a step, I build a little piece of music. You build a piece of music and then we build the step and they work in this way. So lots and lots of I mean, that's only the big works, the big, you know, 20 plus minute works that we did. We also did a lot of things with, um, we had a project called Unboxed where we brought in three um, Asian American choreographers to reimagine the Nutcracker, the divertissement from Nutcracker um, because it's appropriative and it makes you cringe when you watch it, um, visually, especially. Um, I had the thought of, you know, but is it Tchaikovsky's fault? Because the, with the way the music sounds, I'm not sure actually. I got a lot of pushback from a lot of different places, um, whether it's the, the music or the choreography. Um, and then I think it goes to 
how do you how did how did those people um, get to that place? How did Tchaikovsky get to that place um, to write that music? How did Petipa get to that place to make that dance? And then how has that been continually perpetuated? Um, and how do we change that? So that was a really awesome um, collaboration. And then we also did something called 10 by 10, which was 10 Chicago artists that aren't Eurocentric, that do many different things from footwork to Vogue and um, Bra Bratanania, Brat oh my God, I'm saying it wrong, Bratanatian um, dance and connecting those things with these dancers from Hubbard Street and finding, it was really just about a collaboration. It was not about, this is the big thing. It's not about, a, it was not about a, um, a performance. It was about a discussion. And I really think that that is the heart of what we need to be doing more of today. And that's what I wanna inspire you all to do is to reach out and have discussions with other artists in your community and outside of your community. I find that that has been the, the brightest thing about this pandemic and coming through all of these creative processes is the dancers have expressed that there's no way that this would have even come across their mind without the pandemic. This ability to reach across the pond, reach across to the other side of the globe and take a dance class with someone in this moment and then have a discussion about how, you, how are you navigating this? Um, what, are, what are your inspirations? What's inspiring you right now? How do you show up in a space? That's something that has affected me the most in this pandemic is witnessing how we show up for each other in a Zoom space. You know, when you come on and the first thing you ask is, how are you? For a lot of these meetings that we get into and the, or the first thing you check in about is, is everybody okay? And then you, you, you take about 10 minutes before you actually dive into your rehearsal or your class or whatever it is that you're doing. I, I want that to continue. Even when we're in a space and we're in a time crunch, maybe it takes 20 minutes and you only have an hour rehearsal, but what's, what's gonna be more productive in that moment? How are you gonna be more productive in that moment? in so many ways is the answer. Like it, it breaks down the barriers and it puts the, the human at the front. It puts the human um, on top and not the work. And I am all about the work. I mean, I love to work from 10 to 10 on a work for 10 days and, you know, really bang it out. and get to the point where people can't handle it anymore. It's like, we need a break or we need to stop doing this arm movement, you know, but at this, people are much more willing to do that when they're seen as people and not as notes or as steps. Um, so that's, that's really where, where I'm at with this pandemic and what I wanted to share for, for this. Um, at the, I kind of want to open it up and see if, what how y'all have experienced kind of your pandemic time and have a little discussion about that. Um, is there anyone who'd like to jump in and share? I didn't see anything in the chat yet. Um, but yeah, I, I do have some more to share, but I would love to open this up at this moment. I don't want to bark at you much too much. Anyone? Ah, yes. Dominique, I'm going to read it. Is that cool? Awesome. Uh, having a sort of element of dialogue in any creative process is essential to developing the work. Several times I've worked on dance pieces which become too over rehearsed or the choreographer took a separate position from the dancers. Having a space where a healthy conversation, where experimentation, questioning, fun, and moments of serendipity, spontaneity versus a fully controlled Con, uh, constrained process have been my favorite collaborative moments. Yes, absolutely. And I mean, what this makes me think of is even, even when a piece is fully done and, it, you know, a choreographer is like, yes, this is it. I don't need to mess with it anymore, which very rare. I don't really know any choreographers who, who kind of get to that place. Um, but even in that moment, it's 
that is what you remember about the process is how much you were revered as the artist. And it's very simple to do. I mean, my journey getting to being a rehearsal director, because that's not, I didn't know that that was a job per se as a dancer growing up, you know, it was just, oh, it's the person who's telling people what to do, you know, but that having that, it's a real position, you know, it's, it really is so important as a dancer. It was more about caretaking for the people around you. I have a very fast brain and I learn things very quickly on top of being positive. So it was like, oh, you don't have the step? Come on, let's go over here. We're gonna learn the step, we're gonna get it together. And then, oh, nobody has a step? Okay, we're all gonna do it. Let's just figure it out all together. Let's make a song and we'll figure it out. And usually the choreographer or whoever's running the room is like, okay, go ahead. There, nobody gets it, now they're getting it. And then you get it. So it's also about taking that initiative and feeling empowered to, to, to do that. Um, a lot of people, especially in the, I won't say a lot of people, but in the dance community, it's, there's very much this hierarchy that goes on. It's like the teacher and I am the student and I have to do what I'm told and I have to fit into this mold. And I, I, don't, I don't think it's very different in other mediums as well. But what's important is to have that voice because that is, that is the voice that creates change. You know, if we stick to these norms, that's what's going on in the world today, whether it's with gender, sexuality, race, you know, people want to break out of these boxes of de defining, of, of definition. And in order to do that, you have to go in, I believe. You have to really, and that's what's happening. That was what the pandemic really did. It allowed people to take the space and take the time to, to go inward, even if, like me, I didn't have that time alone, actually. It was constant, nonstop working, video editing, everything. But in a way that that was my going in, I had to realize, you know, that that busyness, that working was to support the field and to support these artists um, in a way that I had never done before, um, which is similar to what we've all experienced. We're pushing ourselves and whether that's taking an exorbitant amount of time or having zero amount of time, it was, it pushed us outside of our, our boxes. Um, and I'm really, really grateful for that. And I'm a little nervous. I won't lie about how we're moving forward because it's uncertain. Um, as was mentioned in the previous, uh, the previous se session here, who, you know, they just announced if you've been fully vaccinated, you still put your mask on and put your mask back on, socially distance again. And it's like, what? We're supposed to be going back into the theaters, you know? And, oh, maybe we're not doing that next year. So it's it's almost a preparation moment for this could be worse than where we were before. And not worse in the sense of, you know, the pandemic is worse, but in the sense of how we relate to it being worse. You know, it's like, oh, we have to go back? I mean, I don't know about y'all, but I don't see it happening. I'm like, that. this is gonna be very dramatic if we have to all go back into our homes. and what I have to, my response, where I'm at right now with that is we have to do it with joy and we have to focus in on the process. You know, it can't, it can't, it can't be we're trying to get to this normal or to this stage or to this show. It's got to be a continuous diving in of what we're, what's in front of us, be in the moment find joy in, in what you're able to do. This was so perfect, um, as Ama, how she asked the question, what are you grateful for? What are you thankful for? Ask yourself that all the time throughout this process, throughout this, whatever this journey is about to be, because that's what's gonna hold, hold us up is by staying in that moment and staying creative, staying in a process. I hope that Zoom, and Google Meets and all these things come up with more ways of interacting and of, of, of you know, that they are being creative as well, as creative as we are being um, on their platforms because we might be here for a minute. Um, oh, I see some more things coming up in the chat. I just go, I be talking. So if you got something, if, if these people that are on camera, I will welcome you again to turn on your camera, raise your hand to steer me in a direction. Um, one good pandemic experience, yes. 
I was a composer for dance students in U Hawaii dance choreography class, class conducted in Zoom. And I worked with the dancers online. Probably would not occur in normal class. Exactly. Ernie, I believe I'm saying your name correctly. That's correct. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, uh, you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Okay, so what happened was um, for the dance choreography class, there was some funding for, for dance accompanists for the courses. So the teacher had me come in, be on Zoom, and then, you know, she was working with the students and I would work with, with whoever wanted music, music made for their pieces one-on-one. -on -one. And therefore, you know, I would, we would develop a piece. And I don't know that we would have been able to do that in a normal kind of class environment because my work hours were basically the work I was doing at home composing and then communicating with the dancers back and forth. And we, we came up with some good pieces and then they were able to show those pieces as part of their end of the semester performances and so on. And going forward, I'm going to work with a couple of the dancers for their thesis work for their master's degrees and so on. So a bunch of collaborations that wouldn't have occurred. They wouldn't have even, even had a composer for that class. But because there was funding for the accompanist, it was able to go to me to do that class. So it was and then, did, were you on Zoom? It was on Zoom. It was entirely on Zoom. But then the, the dancers would send me like a video of their dance. And then I would write some music to it, compose it, record it myself as many instruments as I could do at home. And then I would send it to them and we just do it back and forth. So, for example, a, a dancer might say, well, I really like this, but this sound over here and the music makes me feel this and I don't want that. So then I would go back and address that. Or occasionally I would send two contrasting concepts and see which one they resonated with and then see if one of them worked and then take that course. It's so interesting. I'm curious, did you... Was there ever a moment where you were watching them live over Zoom, like the, the camera was in the studio and they did a run for you, or was it only video? It was primarily video, but students were allowed in the studio because it's a big studio with open windows and everything. So occasionally they would do that. But the majority of the work was longer time spent by the dancers putting the pieces together and me doing the music. So it was a little bit of, it, it is true that something like that could go forward where you could have a live studio class and yet still work with somebody on their piece by video. Yeah, by online. absolutely. I mean, definitely. This is something that, that specifically in the OM project I was speaking of, we were able to do just that with the right. musicians over Zoom and the dancers working in real, in real time in that sense, kind of like an improv jam, if you were. Um, yes. So that's, I love that. I love the different ways and I'd love to hear more. Thank you for sharing that, um, that experience. Sure. Um, yes. Yeah, if anybody has more of examples of how they were creating over this time, I think it's, I mean, that was great for me to hear <laughs> that it's happening elsewhere in different ways that it's happening. Uh, I'm gonna lift up Alexis your statement as a composer i found myself leaning more towards music that is not 100 percent controlled by me this is for a number of reasons but two of them are that one i want the performance to have a sense of ownership and collaborative responsibility um, yes the performers there we go and two i also know that the performers will know their instruments and sounds best and I can be a guide rather than a director. I have also learned that this style of music making absolutely has to be process driven and collaborative because there has to be communication and conversation in order to make the best result as a whole collaborative team. You know, Alexis, what this makes me think of is nonverbal communication because I'm, I've been such a huge proprietor of this in the studio, you know, with dance, it's like, we learned that from the get go, who's going across the floor, stand at the corner, make it known that you're going to go across the floor, no one needs to say anything, teacher gives you a look, you know, to pull up, you know, to like turn out, you know, it happens in music, I'm sure as well, there's like, we're artists, so we're in tune with energy, positivity, joyful energy, productivity, you know, we're in tune with those things. So it's real. I, that, especially with improvisation, like there's so many cues that we give each other in order to know to, we're moving to the next uh, idea or in dance, we're gonna, now this is the motif. I'm all about my elbow today for some reason, <laughs> but that's what that makes me, did you wanna uh, expand, expound on this statement at all? 
Um, I mean, I, I noticed that more um, as I've been, you know, sitting by myself more in this office space um, that, you know, I don't want to be the person that's in control of these other things because I can't be in control of anything but myself. So um, it, you know, I also want everybody to feel like they have a role in the process of making something together. And it's not just like the holier than thou composer stereotype um, that presents the information or choreographer or a director or whatever, but like everybody who has put some skin in the game has a responsibility to bring it to life together. So I think that it also is um, sort of like what you're saying, a, a morale booster in some ways, um, but just like a human check-in to see how people are doing. And, and it's, it's very obvious when somebody is playing music that's maybe a little bit more open or improvising or something like that, and they're not having a great day, I think that you can tell in the, in the sounds as well. And so I think that this is, um, I don't know, sort of a, a more holistic approach that uh, has funnily not been as, uh, what I want to say, advocated for in different like academic circles and things that I've been a part of. Um, but this just feels more wholesome to me. And can you, I'm going to probe you a little bit further here about uh, guiding that space. What has your experience been with, you know, I know that you're allowing for this freedom, allowing for the improv, but then in terms of like shepherding into in a certain direction that maybe isn't a direction that people are going and how's your experience been with that and maybe some tools that you've used? Yeah, I also, I mean, I, I had a background as a middle and high school band director for a while. So I feel like if I was able to work with um, teenagers that like working with adults most of the time is a lot easier than that. <laughs> so, um, but I, I find that I, I always want people to know like that, that I appreciate what they're doing. So I do my best to always say thank you after each run, even if it was just not at all what I wanted. Um, and that everyone kind of knows that what they're contributing is something that's still really important and and it helps along the way to figure out what not to do or what ideas aren't um necessarily the ones that we're wanting to implement as well so i uh, you know at the same time i think something that i uh, that i personally need to work on is just how you can have a constructive conversation that is getting a little bit more at the heart of the matter um so that's just like you know, personal reflection on it. But I found that this has been a pretty um, fulfilling process as opposed to here's the music, play the music, and that's it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, I don't know, many of you may not know that with this festival, um, I was charged with bringing the artists, the dance artists together um, into this festival for this collaboration, actually. Um, and we had, quite a few applicants, I think over 50 applicants, um, choreographers and dancers alike. And what I was really, really looking for in all of the applications that were put forth were a sense of curiosity and a sense of collaboration and play. Um, people who were really interested in the unknown, as it were, um, and that the work reflected that, that they would submit. So yeah, I love that, that sense of giving the ownership and um, the, the power, I guess, or the, the freedom to, to express how you want to, that will guide it. And honestly, that's what, that's what the world needs today is a little bit of consideration of what the people that are in the process actually need and want and, and building it from there, as opposed to this is what we're gonna do, you know, because then there's no, there's no investment in what it is and then it becomes well, well what then what is it and what do we have then we're left with us which is actually good as well because then we build something that once we realize oh it's just us all we have is us so let's build something else <laughs> which is really really great um i love that um, i'm just checking the chat here yes oh i love it love it yeah um so let me just jump here to this yes time okay this time flies when you're talking about art <clears throat> so yes um 
new ways to connect. Yes, I talked about the reverence and the space. Absolutely. Uncertainty. Yes. Okay. So finally, I kind of want to go into this thing about, it's a little bit of a jump, but in for dance, for me, as a choreographer, when I'm creating something, I don't ever really see the work for what it is until I'm watching it with other people. Like, you know, the piece is done, we're having a showing and uh, we invite people into the studio and it's not actually, I shouldn't say the piece is done at any moment in the process. And we invite people in to watch and suddenly it's a completely different work than what the entire process was. Um, you could just by the raise of hand thing, does this happen for musicians as well when you're composing music or playing music? Do you hear it different? Yes, see, I'm seeing yeses. You hear it differently as soon as other people are hearing this music. Yes, yes, yes. That has become, that is such an interesting thing for me, especially over Zoom and in the digital realm because I am watching this thing over and over and over again. I used to always think that it's just because, oh, well, it's being performed in a different way. There's, it's the energy that's in the room, but energy is trans is transmitting through these screens that we're in. We feel like it's so different because we're not in space and we've lost something. But in my experience this past year, and I would I welcome any um, like disagreeing or agreeing with this both, it doesn't feel much different. Actually, that part of it specifically, like I do feel like I'm with people in the space that we are exchanging energy in the room. I mean, think I, you see people so much clearer. An example would be uh, for Hubbard Street. We held an audition for the company over Zoom. 900 dancers we saw for four, four positions. Yes, jaw open. Um, it was mad, but I was shocked and amazed that you can see so much more. We will be implementing this virtual audition from now on because of how much more you can see over Zoom. And not to mention the accessibility part of it, um, that we're able to reach so many more people in this way um, that perhaps would not have been able to, um, to audition before. But it's absolutely incredible how much energy is transitioning and let alone like, oh, this person's not paying any attention. They're over there stretching in the back of the room while we're teaching the combination. Oh, they don't have the combination. I wonder why. Now there's no question. If you're in the studio with them, you can hide behind some dancers. If you don't know the comedy, you can go in the last group or something like this. No, no. This is very exposing, both physically and energetically, I think. Um, I would love if anyone has any experience with experiencing that transference of energy over Zoom, over the internet, because I was shocked at that. I did not think that that was at all possible. I mean, yes, we've all had FaceTime and you can read, again, the nonverbal communication thing. You can read facial cues if someone doesn't like something. It's just such a subtle little thing that you can see on their face and boop, it's like, okay, we'll, we'll change subjects. We won't talk about that. You know, or someone just turning off their camera because they don't want to do this or the unmute thing. If a bunch of people are talking and someone unmutes themselves like, oh, they want to talk. Do you, are you a type of person who pays it? Like those things that we pay attention to. That's what I want to carry over somehow into this joyful process that is the real world, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I, I can only see I never paid. Hold on, I got to move my screen over. Never paid attention to that. <laughs> It's fine. No, I mean, it, but it's interesting what does pop out to us in this space. And I'm so curious about how we can move that stuff, carry that stuff over with us. I think it's so important. What I'm, what I focus in on and what I do know about it right now, what I'm really focusing in on today is the, the nonverbal communication of it, the, the cues of it, the awareness, the sensitivity, that's the best word, the sensitivity for how we show up in a space. And the eagerness that we will have when we are able to, if we are able to be in a space with other people to be productive so that that, and that eagerness doesn't overtake 
the reverence for the energy that we are, the blessing that we are able to share space and create art together. So often that, I mean, there are, there are walls, there are financial walls, like we need to do this because we need to make the money because otherwise we can't do it, we gotta pay people. All of these things are absolutely there. Um, especially the, the redheaded stepchild of dance, you know, <laughs> like we have no money, but, but yes. Oh, I thought you were saying something, Brendan. Um, got you. <laughs> I do it all the time until I'm dirty. Um, but yeah, yes, that sensitivity, that reverence for this gift that we've been given um, is where I'm really coming from. And that's really all that I wanted to communicate and share with you all in this chat today was just don't forget about that don't forget about how how attentive we've been in this time um, and how much listening we've had to do both to what people are saying because we're on mute and we're on a zoom call and physically the listening that we have to do how much I mean we pay so much attention to what people's houses look like what is that in the background and then when we pay we work so hard to get just a clean background or to blur out the background or so that people focus in on what we're saying you know how do we this is all movement this is all dance in my view um, I was in love with watching uh, the collaboration the hour before because there was just so much movement going on in the space while the oboe was happening and in the interim like in the individual the movements of the camera like I'm fascinated by all of that because it's the idiosyncrasies of the people who are there the things that we're not actually there to see are the things that I love to pay attention to because that's how you learn something about who you're looking at you know and what how you engage with what this platform is, it's almost like Zoom has to be another person. You know, this is the vehicle. It can't just be the vessel that we're connecting through. It has to be its own character that we revere and regard and communicate with and use in that way. Um, any, any thoughts at the end for anyone we're here about seven seven more minutes or so um i'd love to hear from all of you and i have i have one little exercise that i'd like to do at the end as well brandon yes um you you brought up so many interesting points about keeping some of the things virtual because you notice more and translating how we how we transmit that energy both through the screen and in person and I'm, I'm still processing all of that, but the most immediate thing that came to me was just being more communal when we're in person, yeah. you know, like stripping away the hierarchies uh, because, you know, as, as a queer person, you know, queer life is all about community. I mean, you know, it's about chosen family and such. And I think of the arts practices are similar and that you know we're creating together, we're sitting together, we're standing together, we're moving together, we're playing together, and it's a kind of community. And you know, some hierarchy is needed, but I think just treating each other a little differently as you know, friends, colleagues, family, if, if that makes sense, you know, ha having these conversations in person, not being like I'm just gonna do this and do this and do this. Um, but I think in order for that to work, you know, everybody has to be on the same page. But what the, t the takeaway I, I get from this is just talk and share more in the in-person spaces. Absolutely, I love that everybody needs to be on the same page. And that's really where I come from with starting with movement, starting with breath. So often I get into spaces virtual and in real life where people are like, I want to dance, I'm not a dancer, I don't know what that is. It's like, you walk to the, you walk to the bathroom, you be turning your head, looking left and right. You pick up, you pick, you turn on your computer, that's movement, that's dance, we all. So just the simple, move, just that simplicity really gets us on the same page. It could just be a clap, you know, that we all do at the same time. And that, that aligns certain part of us, not every part, of course, but 
again, that's also a big part of the check-in at the beginning, getting everybody on the same page so that we can, we can really do that, come together in that way. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. Hi, Sama. How are you? I'm good. I have a question for you. Yes. Um, about your engagement with NextFest, because a lot of people might not know how this work you've done has manifested. So I just wanted to ask you to tell us about why you happen to be and the what of and the why of. Yes. So um, prior to me coming, thank you for asking that, prior to coming to Hubbard Street, I was on faculty, part-time faculty at UCI uh, with Lara Lubavitch. And that is where I met Miss Rye. And um, we connected there and spoke and she brought me in and introduced me to Peter here actually. Um, and so, as I mentioned before, I was um, charged with bringing in these dancers and these choreographers to collaborate with the musicians. Um, and it was really, it's really been an incredible experience for me. I'm on a journey to be, towards becoming a director um, of a company. Um, wherever um, it's it's my it's the journey that I'm on right now and so this was really a welcome and needed experience in looking at artists from different backgrounds and finding what relates what what speaks to my spirit and what I think needs to go out into the world and be shared with other artists to elevate our field so I'm I'm really really grateful for that I'm what I'm not grateful for is how busy my schedule, our season ended on Sunday was our last premiere. Um, and I've actually been running all of the streams from my home um, and all of the talkbacks. I learned how to do live streaming and everything. So I haven't been able to be a part of the process, unfortunately, but I'm so glad to be here today and to have witnessed what happened earlier today. Um, but yes, yeah, so that, is, that is how I am connected. And I hope to be more connected in the future with this uh, program because as, um, Ama and Peter and I spoke more, the more and more we spoke, especially with Peter about his vision for this and what it's been in the past. I'm just like, oh, yes, this is exactly what I love. This is exactly what needs to be happening. This needs to be everywhere. Um, so yes, I, I definitely want to thank you. Um, oh, and you are, you are the hero. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was a lot coming. It was a lot of people to look at. And I thought it was going to be overwhelming looking at all of the applications and things, but I was, I couldn't stop looking at them. I would look at them like four and five times, you know, just to see the work that's out there and to be um, moved by that. There was just so much drive and passion and urgency is really what I saw. To, to collaborate. People really, really wanted to meet other artists and to get into a space of collaboration. That's what we've all been craving. Even before the pandemic, people are craving connectivity, craving collaboration. Um, and it's been really, really beautiful to witness and I'm excited to see more. Um, last thing, could we all Everyone in here, put one word into the chat about how you're feeling moving forward in this space of collaboration today. Just one word. Mine is hope. I'd love to fill the, the, the chat with words of forward motion. Yes, hungry. <laughs> Excited, curious, refreshed, motivated, motive hopeful, love it, ecstatic, encouraged, curious, productive, joyful. Thanks, Derek. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for spending this hour with me, hearing me ramble on about joy and process. And um, I wish all of you a joyful process moving forward through this unknown space that we are all a part of together, whether we like it or not. <laughs>
Yeah, thanks so much, Jonathan. I'm so grateful to you for everything that you've done. I mean, even though you've been sort of busy doing other things, your spirit has sort of infused the whole process with the people that you've brought together to make art together. Um, and I'm grateful to Asama for introducing us. And like you said, the conversations that we had, I just feel like um, this is just the beginning of, of many more collaborations. It, it felt really easy. Um, and just so grateful for all of that work you did, um, finding great people and for inspiring us all for the last hour. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Peter.